Matthew chapter number 7 and uh, verse number 13. Jesus said this. This is probably one of the first messages Jesus ever preached. Matthew records it here in chapter number 7. And Jesus said these words, not Brother Adam, not the preacher. This is Jesus, all right? If you got the right Bible, it's in red. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That word straight means narrow. For wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leadeth, say it with me, to destruction. And Jesus said there's going to be many which will go therein. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And Jesus said, few. Be there that find it. Our Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for the reading of your word. I pray, God, now that you would bless the preaching of your word. Lord, you said it was through the preaching of the cross to them that perish was foolishness. But God, unto us that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. I pray, God, that you'd anoint your word. You anoint these verses of Scripture we're fixing to read. And you'd speak to our hearts. God, as only you can. I can't do it. I'd love to. I'd love to be able, Lord, to open eyes and open hearts and open ears. But, God, I'm unable. But, God, you said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I pray, God, that you would bless your word this morning and you'd use it for your glory and you'd use it for your honor. We'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13 and 14 um, this is the one of the first times Jesus is in his public ministry and he's preaching. And uh, it's amazing to me that one of the very first messages that Jesus starts to preach about is not heaven, the place where he came from. He's preaching on hell, place where people are going. That's what he preached. You'd think it'd be the opposite. He'd brag about where he came from and where he could take you to. But no, he's preaching a message of warning. And when he comes to our text verse this morning, he says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth to life, and few be there that find it. Now there's two different paths that he's talking about this morning. He's talking about broad is the way. That's talking about a wide road. I would probably say something like a 16-lane highway is what I, what I think of when I think of a broad road way. And he said this wide way, this broad way, it leadeth to destruction. And that word destruction means misery. It means misery in hell. It's talking about death. It's talking about hell. And then he he talks about it a little bit more in verses 21 down through verse number 23. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And so he's telling you that there's, there's a way that is wide. He said there's a way that is full. It leads to destruction. He said, but then there's another way, and it's called narrow is the way. Narrow is the way. That word narrow means a compressed way, a small way. Let me just give it to you in good old Georgia vernacular language. Uh, Narrow is opposite of broad. Narrow is opposite of wide. And he said, now that road that's narrow, that's not as broad, that's wide, he said, it leads to life. It leads to life eternal, life everlasting. In our text verse this morning, for the first time ever, this is the only place where you'll find Jesus giving a traffic report in the Bible. He gives a weather report in the Bible and tells us exactly what it's going to be like in the last days. The moon is going to turn into blood. The sun will refuse to shine. I mean, we got some good weather reports, but this is a traffic report this morning. And Jesus is saying there's two roads, there's two paths, there's two different ways. There's one that's narrow, there's one that's wide. There's two different directions. One leads to life everlasting, the other leads to death and destruction. And Jesus gives the traffic report. And this is sobering, and this ought to make us all wake up this morning. Jesus said many are on the wrong highway. I would say the highway towards hell. Amen. And he said, few are on the right highway, the highway that leads to life everlasting. I was trying to think of a good way to give you an image this morning. This is the only one I could think of was exactly what Jesus is talking about. Most of you can't see this, 
But on the right side of the highway, there's about three or four cars that's straight ahead. And then coming the opposite direction is all the other traffic. I mean, let me ask you this morning, which which road do you think would be considered many and which road would you be considering few? That's what Jesus said. In other words, he said there's way more people dying and going to hell than there is going to heaven. I didn't say that, but Jesus said that. It's amazing to me, Brother Kid. every funeral I've ever went to, every funeral I've ever attended, they're always in heaven. They can live a life of drugs and alcohol and sex and immorality and be a drunkard their whole life and never open a Bible and never pray and never read their Bible. And, man, they bury them. And I worked in a funeral home, and I've watched them. They bury them. And, man, they don't know whether they're in heaven or hell, but they find some preacher that will tell everybody he's in heaven. Dr. Frank Turek said this, and I'll never forget it. He said, it's amazing to me, the people that think they're in heaven when they die. He said, because in this life, they rejected God. They rejected His church. They rejected His Bible. They rejected the gospel. They didn't have nothing to do with God. They never prayed. They never fasted. They never, they never tithed. They never gave. They never done anything for the Lord. But they accept, they, they, they believe that when they get to the other side, God's just going to let them into heaven. But they didn't want nothing to do with Him here. Jesus said there's two roads. There's one going towards destruction. There's one going towards life. Now, here's the the reality of the fact. I want you to listen real closely. Everybody in this room right now is on one or two of these roads. And I would be willing to say this morning there's more of you on the other road than there is on the few. I mean, that that few crowd right there, I know one or two of them. I'm talking about really, truly been saved and born again. But this other road over here, I know a lot of folks that's heading down the wrong road and the wrong path, and they're heading down it fast. And here's my goal this morning. My goal is just to take the Word of God and preach what the Bible says and try to give some instructions on how to drive and how to handle this this situation that a lot of people are in. And my goal this morning is just to preach the Word of God, but I believe it's the Holy Spirit's goal, and it's His job to open your eyes and show you which traffic lane you're sitting in. He's going to let you know if you're going north or south. Amen. It's like that It's like that man said, listen, when I die, he said, I want you to put all my stuff up in the attic. He said, so that way when I leave this world, he said, I'll stop by the attic and pick up all my goodies on my way to heaven. And when he died, guess what? His wife went up in the attic and looked and all this stuff was still there. And she said, I knew I should have put it in the basement. You're, you're, going, you're, going one, one, you're going one way or the other. And, and listen, there's not, and here's the thing. There's nothing that you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And there's four vehicles that will lead you on the highway to hell. And I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I have sat in several of these vehicles, and so I'm preaching based on experience this morning. And the number one vehicle that is sending most people to hell, the highway towards hell, is the vehicle of religion. Amen. Religion. It's amazing to me how many religious people there are in this world. Matter of fact, it seems to me like the world is getting more religious and the church is getting less religious. I don't know about y'all, but I've noticed that lately. Like a lot of people that claim to know God, they pray and and uh, they, they say pray for me and they try to sound religious and they try to put on a facade. But I'm going to tell you something, that is the number one thing that will send you to hell quicker than anything on this earth is a vehicle of religion. And I sat in that vehicle. I mean, I had a preaching papa. I had a preaching great papa. I had a song leading daddy. I had a Sunday school teaching mama. And buddy, I was Brother Alex. I was riding their coattails all the way to heaven because I knew there was no way that a loving God could send little old me to hell because man, I knew the Romans road. I knew the Ephesians bypass and the Philippians overhaul. I knew all the verses in the Bible. I've actually even led people to God and told them how to get saved. But man, I was on the wrong road. I was sitting in the car of religion and I was headed straight towards hell. You realize it was the religious people of the day of Jesus that put him on the cross. And listen, it wasn't the lost man. It wasn't the, it wasn't the infidel. It wasn't the murderer. It wasn't the whoremonger. You know what it was? It was the religious crowd that didn't like Jesus. And by the way, Jesus didn't like them either. Listen to what he said to them in Matthew's gospel, chapter number 23 and verse number 27. Jesus said, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you 
hypocrites, for you're like the whited sepulchers. Indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but within are full of dead men's bones and of un all uncleanliness. Verse 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Jesus said that. Who did he say that to? He said it to the crowd that was wearing the suit and tie. He said that to the crowd that knew how to spit white and to pull it tight. He, he was talking to that crowd that taught the class, that sit into the Bible preaching, that went to church, that had a that had a church membership. Man, they've been dumped 15, 14 times in a baptistry. Hey, there's a crowd of people now that believe if you eat a cookie, you can go to heaven. They're called Catholics. Cookies ain't going to get you into heaven. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to get you to heaven. I don't care if you eat a wafer on Sunday morning or a waffle on Sunday morning. That ain't going to get you to heaven. Amen. I, on my way to church this morning, I don't know how many places I passed, how many different denominations, how many different religions. Listen, at the end of the day, there's only one thing that matters and one thing at all. Listen, it's not Baptist. It won't be Church of God. It won't be Pentecostal. It won't be non-denominational. It won't be the Presbyterians. It won't be the Catholic or the seven-day disadvantage. Say amen right there. But I'll tell you what's going to matter at the end of this thing. It's going to be, do you know Jesus? And does Jesus know you? Because that's all that matters. When we close our eyes in death, uh, we're going to open our eyes in eternity and we better know that we know that we know that we know that our sins have been forgiven and we flung ourselves at the foot of the cross and that's Jesus to save our old wretched souls. I remember back years ago I would constantly get invited to the Fulton County Jail. That's the only place to let me preach, Fulton County. And I'd go over there to Five North and I'd walk up in there and I'm going to tell you something, there would be, there would be probably three, four hundred men down there at the Fulton County Jail. And man, we'd get in there and we'd preach and we'd give the gospel message. And man, here they'd come. They'd come down there and then they would, they would say a prayer. And everybody in there, man, they'd shout and say amen. We'd go back probably a two, three weeks later back to that same jail. And them guys back in there, they getting saved again. And then getting saved again. It was like a constant rotate. And I just prayed, God, let one of them stick. Amen. Praise God. Let one of them get it. And then one day we were down at the varsity. Anybody ever been down there? Thank God for the varsity. I mean, if there ain't no heaven on this side of eternity, it's the varsity, all right? Frosted oranges, slaw dogs, onion rings dipped in that honey from heaven, grease, praise God, dripping. I love that place, amen? You can tell I love that place. And I'm, we, was down there, we was down at the varsity, and there's this old boy. I remembered him preaching to him on 5 North, and man, he was the one that led the singing. He, he was the one that led Amazing Grace. Could, I mean, could sing. And he was walking out in the middle of the road. And I looked over. I said, Charles, is that you? And he, he come over and he said, praise God. I had a bottle of beer in his hand. I said, what are you doing? He said, man, I'm out here jaywalking, trying to get arrested, man. He said, I'm hungry. I said, you, huh? What? What are you talking about? I thought you, you were the song leader up on 5 North. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to go back to 5 North. I'll have a bed at night, a nice place to sleep. He said, and best, best security this side of heaven. Amen. Best security. <laughs> best security. He said, matter of fact, they're going to feed me three times a day. He said, I'm out here trying to go back. Dr. Oliver B. Green said he was preaching a tent meeting one night, and he said he was out soul winning the day before, and he ran across an old guy on the street corner, had a big old bottle of beer in his head. He said, I know you. You're Hey, he said, you're Oliver B. Green. He said, you saved me years ago. He said, I must have. He said, it wasn't God that did it. I'm going to tell you, the number one vehicle that's sending men and women to hell is the vehicle of religion. You know what they've got? They've got a head religion of God. They, they believe in God. They know God. They might even have said a prayer or repeated something, but I'm going to tell you something. The vehicle of religion is sending people to hell. And I'm going to say it's going to be a sad day for some people when they open their eyes in eternity and they're going to be holding on to a church membership or a baptism certificate or they're going to be holding on to a false profession of faith. I'm preaching to somebody this morning and they're going be holding on to that and God's going to look at them and this is what they'll say. Lord, Lord. Look at verse number 22. Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord. We prophesied your name. We've done many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus will say I never knew you. I don't know who you are. I'm going to tell you the vehicle that sends you straight to hell faster than anything is religion. And I had it for years. 
And I'm going to tell you, it was only until the Holy Ghost of God came to where I was. And he pulled the scales from off my eyes, and I saw the road that I was on. I saw the path that I was on, and I knew I was on my way to hell. And, buddy, I needed to change directions quick. And I knew it was the last time he was going to deal with me, too, buddy. I felt my heart about to beat out of my chest, and I said, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and save my soul. You know, I've not even prayed, I've not prayed that prayer since. You say, why? Because once saved, always saved, praise God. You know what everlasting life is? Forever and ever and ever. One lady said one time, well, I tell you what, you can jump out of the hand of Jesus. That's a mighty small hand if you can jump out of it. Hi, amen. That's a mighty small hand if you can jump out of the hand that scooped up and traced courses for the rivers and heaped up the mountains and thumped the stars in their sockets and put the earth in rotation around the sun. Look up in here. That's a small hand you can jump out of, ma'am. I tell you, religion is sending people to hell. He talks about beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They are inwardly, but they are raving wolves. God help us. We're seeing that in this day and hour which we live in. Raving wolves. The vehicle of religion. i got to hurry. Number two, the vehicle of rebellion. The vehicle of rebellion. You, you, you don't have to turn your Bibles too far, but in the book of Luke, there was a man by the name of the, the prodigal son. And the Bible said that he came to his father and he said, Give me. Give me thy inheritance. And the Bible said that he went into the far country and he wasted his inheritance and he spent all that he had on righteous living and harlots because he said, it's, hey, he had that Burger King mentality, my way or the highway, amen, my way right away. And he said, give me, give me, give me. And he went into that far country and he spent all he had. And I'm going to tell you, that's exactly the generation that we're living in right now. I mean, it, it, hey, it's do unto others before they do unto you. I mean, that's the mentality that we have today. And this, this whole entitlement generation, they call them the millennials. They have no respect for their authority. They have no respect for law and order. They have no respect for their parents. I mean, I can't. I, I get half backslid when I walk into Walmart and see a little punk talking to his mom and dad. Mom will tell you something. They're to knock his head down, knock his teeth down his throat talking to him. If I listen, if I ever did that, I wouldn't be standing here today. I'm living proof. My parents took care of business at the house. Amen. There's just some things you not do. My dad will whoop me. I think the Liberty Bell cracked again. He got done with me. Amen. Thank God, thank God for these moms and dads that said we ain't going to put up with it. But you know what we got right now? We got a bunch of disobedient little thugs running around here. Got the little mask on. They loving this new mask mandate, don't they? They love that mask. They like covering up that face. They like covering up their face. They like putting on all that black. They like destroying these cities and these towns and, these, and the rioters. All, you know what all that is? It's, it's the sin of witchcraft. The Bible said that rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. And if you let your little kids talk back to you and talk to you like you're dirt, you might as well buy them a Ouija board for Christmas and let them play around with the witches on the weekend. Rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. We're living in that day. Nobody has respect anymore for any type of authority whatsoever. And what a shame and a disgrace that we've raised a generation that has, that has lived a life of disobedience and rebellion and disobedient to parents. And listen, we, we've, most of them now that have grown, they're in Congress and they're in the Senate. They all never were told no as little kids. I don't think Nancy Pelosi was never told no as a little girl. I'll tell you what, buddy, we've raised a generation that don't know God. They're rebellious. And I'll tell you what, they say, well, not, this ain't for me. You know what the Bible says? The Bible said, for God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. Amen. I, I'll never forget the night I came to Jesus. Man, I, my chest wasn't poked out. I wasn't popping bubble gum trying to get to the Lord. I tell you what, I was on my knees and I was weeping and I was crying. And I saw myself an undone, unregenerated sinner on my way to hell. And I'd realized that I had rebelled against God. Listen, the reason God put the law in stone was so that you couldn't bend it. He put it in stone so that you couldn't break it. Amen. That's where we're at in this day and generation. The vehicle of rebellion. And I could spend an hour and a half preaching here. I'm trying to move along real quick. But I'm going to tell you another, another vehicle that you're going to find on this road to damnation is the vehicle of riches. Boy, Satan's really used that in this generation. You know what the Bible says in Luke 16? The Bible said the rich man died. And he lift up his eyes in 
hell. You know what? There's a lot of people, they trust in their own popularity. They trust in their own philanthropy. And they, 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 they give and they do. And they're well known in the community. And they're part of the maces and mooses and gooses and elks and flamingos and all the other parties in the town. And I mean, they, they're, they're, they're good people and they're, and, they're, and they're gracious people and they love to give and they, and they brag about, I, listen, I don't care how big your house is. I don't care how big your car is. Listen, none of that stuff, none of that stuff matters when you die. After working for four and a half years in the funeral home business in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm going to tell you one thing I never saw following a hearse and that was a U-Haul truck. I never saw that. And there's a lot of people that get up in the morning and they go to bed in the evening and they're doing it for one thing and one thing only and that is paper money. Money. That is the almighty dollar, and they're trying to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And listen, there's nothing wrong with having things, but when things have you, I'm going to tell you, there's something wrong with that. And they accumulate and accumulate, and they're trying to get this wealth. And listen, their drug addicted, whoremonging kids will take that and squander it when they're dead and gone. I see it every day in the business I'm in. Mom and dad worked their whole life scratching and save. And then here comes their little pothead, methhead kid, teeth missing from all the drugs. They look they, they, they're, they're 29 years old and they look like they're 99 years old. Why? Because of riches. Because of wealth. You know what Jesus said about wealth? You know what he said about riches? He said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. You know why? Because they trust in their 401k. They trust in that bank account. They trust in their money. They say, well, man, I'm going to tell you something. I've, I've gave and I've done this and I've done it. God, don't give a flip about any of that. We've done many wonderful works in your name. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. And I'm going to tell you, the da a dangerous place to be is when you get to the place where you say, you know what? I don't need God. And that's what, listen, that's what wealth does. There are some people, they're so wealthy, they don't need God. They don't need the church. They don't need a Bible. They got enough money to fix all their problems. But I'm going to tell you, when they stand before the thrash holy God and his eyes are a flame of fire and they're standing at the judgment seat, I'm going to tell you, the Bible said that, that wood, that hay, and that stubble will burn before the eyes of a thrash holy God and it will consume them along with their wealth and their goods. And then will I depart from them, ye that work iniquity? I never knew you. I'm going to tell you, this road, where's my picture? That road we've got is filled with cars of religion. That, 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 that line of traffic is filled with cars of riches, people that think they've got it all under control, and it's filled with cars of rebellion. They're going to go up my way, my way, right away. But I'm going to give you this last one, and I'm done. I'm gonna, I mean, there's a bunch more I could say this morning, but I'm going to be honest with you. This. Listen. The number one vehicle that will send you down this road, this path, this traffic report Jesus has given, is the vehicle of reluctance. The vehicle of reluctance. You know, some people think that when they die, they're just going to get to heaven, and then they're going to work it out then. That's like, that's like going out here and killing somebody, and then getting caught, and then going and waiting until they go before the judge. And when they stand before the judge, they say, listen, now I heard you're a good judge and everything. I heard you got a good family, and I heard you love people, and I heard, I heard you're just and you're merciful. I, I need you to let me off the hook. And you know what that judge would say to you and me? He'd say, you know what? The reason I got voted in was because I was a good judge, and it's because I'm upholding the law, and I'm upholding the standards, and I'm upholding all these things. And listen, and because I'm a good judge, and I'm upholding the law, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. That's what's, that's what's going to be said one day. Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse number 1. Solomon, probably the wisest man that ever lived. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote these words in Proverbs chapter number 27 and verse number 1. Listen to what he said. He said, boast not thyself of tomorrow. <laughs> boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not. What a day may bring forth. I'm going to tell you something. We don't know, we don't know about tomorrow. The, there's only one thing keeping you from eternity. There's one thing keeping me from eternity. You know what it is? It's one heartbeat, one tick away. He said, well, I got a pacemaker. Those things run out of batteries too, good neighbor. Pacemaker.
I heard somebody say that one time. I said, you got to be, don't get around no rare earth neodymium magnets. That'll stop it really, really, really quick. I get that disclaimer on my magnets all the time. Don't put near pacemaker. That's, listen, that's how close we are from eternity. There, listen, there, there have been times where I have came to church, Brother Ken, and I have preached a message like this, and I have poured out my heart, and I said, this is what God's got for the hour. This is the message for the hour. And people said, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And they walk out those back doors, and I never see them again because I, the, the next time I see them, they're sitting in a stinking casket. Right. And I'm going to be honest with you, Every time we would get a body into the funeral home and I would walk over to that body, you know what I would say? I bet you he didn't think this was the last time he was going to put on those pair of socks today. I bet you this, he, he had no clue this was the last time he was going to put those boots on today. I remember we got a phone call one afternoon. Or the coroner called us, and we went down there to the house, and it was the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. This man in a young, healthy body was laying next to this big old gigantic oak tree. There were sawdust shavings everywhere. The chainsaw was still in his hands. He is cutting down a tree and died of a massive heart attack. His wife found him several hours later. You know what she said? She said, I didn't, I, I didn't even have to call 911. She said, I just called the funeral home. He was already gone. He died while he was cutting a tree. Dropped dead. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, the, the vehicle Satan will use is tell you, you got tomorrow to figure this thing out. We may not have tomorrow. We may not have tomorrow. Proverbs 29 and verse number 1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck suddenly will be destroyed without remedy. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Listen to this, verse number 35. Jesus said this, He said, To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. He said, Their foot shall slide in due time. It's coming, whether you like it or not. For the day of their calamity is at hand. We don't know when that day is. I don't know when that day is. But you know what? It's amazing to me that death is real. I mean, it happens. It, you know, I forget the number now off the top of my head, but I forget how many thousands of people die every second around the world. But it seems like it don't bother. I think we've gotten numb to it through video games, through Hollywood, through movies, and just being around. It, 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 we, it never even crosses our mind. But I'm going to tell you what's so dangerous about the vehicle of reluctance this morning. Listen to this. Listen to this. When you're on that highway, that vehicle of reluctance, you go to pump the brakes, they're going to go to the floorboard, and they're not, it's not going to stop. That's, that's the sad part about the vehicle of reluctance. You think you can stop it. You think you have control of it. You think you can slow it down. But there's no stopping the car of reluctance. Man, destruction's ahead, and there's nothing that you can do about it. It's been about two years ago, me and Amanda, we were on our way back home on a, I guess it was on a Saturday night. We had the kids with us, and we were coming up 365, and I had my phone out, and it was sitting in the, the console of the, of the van, and I heard that little voice come on there, that little Google voice that said, alert, deteriorating traffic ahead. Slow down ahead. Exit now. And I watched, Brother Alex, as the exit went right past, and we just kept going. I thought, it's a Saturday night. It's a Saturday night. There ain't no traffic out. Little Google girl in there in my phone, she thinks she knows it all. I ain't letting no woman tell me what to do, bless God. Turn around now. Exit now. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and there was a sea. And I call it the Red Sea because that's all I saw was red taillights all the way up 365. And I said, where's that exit? Maybe we got time to get off. There was, no, there was not another exit. We sit there, Brother Ken, for an hour. We sat there for two hours. Then I heard, Daddy, we got to go to the bathroom. And I said, 
I've never done this. You asked my wife. I said, I've never done this before. You know what? It's Saturday night. It's, we're knocking on the door of midnight. We got to get home. We got to get the kids in bed. We get, I know we got church on Sunday. And I want to tell you something. We turn that vehicle around in the middle of 985, and I took that town and country through the grass. And people started following me, and we all was turning around, and we was, we was heading out of there. I'm going to tell you something. The road to destruction, they, they is no exit. There is no turnaround. And ever since that night, I've made my mind up. I've made my decision that it don't matter where I'm going, Brother Ken. It don't matter where I'm traveling. My radio is going to be set to WSB. That's exactly right. And the Google is going to be setting on the dashboard. I want alerts immediately. And you know what they say about that WSB chopper that flies around 285 down in Atlanta? You know what they say? That Captain Herb Emery. We had me miss Captain Herb Emery. I mean, we all miss Captain Herb. He kept us out of so much traffic. But I'm going to tell you what they'd say about that WSB chopper. That this is what they'd say. They'd say that he was the eye in the sky. And if my radio was tuned in, WT, if my radio was tuned in to the proper channel, I could get the message. Trouble's ahead. You know what John said? John said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. There's some people that have sit in church their whole life and they've never been tuned into the right channel. And they're going to drop off into hell. 